For more now, uh, we turn to CBS News senior national security analyst and former Homeland Security advisor to President George W. Bush, Fran Townsend. Fran, thanks so much for joining us. So there were a series of raids overnight. We know that a number of people have been arrested, but uh, authorities also told us that uh, there's only one suspect, really, in terms of this terror attack. So what should we take away from the knowledge that now there are several people who are under arrest? So, you know, the, it's interesting. They haven't released the name. They obviously know who the suspect is, and that's because of the sensitive stage of the investigation. In the first 72 hours, what you're looking at is, were there others who influenced him? Are there others who assisted him? And so clearly authorities and the raids in Birmingham and around London and these arrests are working in that first nucleus of people who might pose an additional threat. Once they're satisfied that they've identified those, they will then re begin to release names and things and give us more information. Mm -hmm. We do know from Theresa May's statement uh, to Parliament that the individual suspect who's now dead was known to the British Intelligence Service, MI5. That's their version of the FBI, their internal security service, as someone who was a peripheral player, a, a, an Islamist, um, that they had looked at but but somehow dismissed as not being a current threat. Mm -hmm. Fran, time and time again, we hear that these folks who carry out these heinous attacks are born in the countries that they attack. In this case, this man was born in the UK. Uh, what can be done to prevent that? I mean, we're trying to ban people coming from other countries to the United States, for example, but it appears that these attackers in many cases are homegrown. Right. Well, in, in fairness, Vlad, they come from both varieties, right? There's not one sort of pattern. If there was, it would be easier to prevent these things. And so in the case of the Nice attacker who used the truck, um, he had come into France and he was alienated. But what you're looking for are patterns. And so I'd suggest to you we're now, when you look at... Uh, it, have they had contact with police? In the, we know now in the British case, the MI5 had investigated him. We know in the Nice, in the nice instance, um, he had had petty crimes. He was, they both, you know, it, clearly the guy in Nice and the guy at Orly had alcohol or drug right. problems. Mm -hmm. And so what you're looking for are patterns. In these just handful of cases, when you see these things, it at least gives police, it, looking backwards now, things that they can look for going forward um, to try and identify these people beforehand. These are sort of big indicators that these people have other problems, which makes them vulnerable to radicalization and recruitment. Um, and, you know, we, we will see what they get out of these raids. Did he have, was he listening to the tapes of Anwar al-Awlaki, the oh, al-Qaeda right. preacher, which we've seen in past cases, has been a tool of radicalization. Um, and those are the sorts of things, that, the hints that we'll use going forward to see are there patterns that we can identify to prevent these people before they take a common ordinary object like a car or a knife to use against civilians. No, but I think that there are probably, you know, there's probably a swath of people that fall into that category. That's the right. Petty crimes and interests in, uh, you know, extremism, at least watching videos online or something along those lines. In this case, as you mentioned, MI5 made contact with him uh, several years ago, and then they sort of went on beyond that uh, initial investigation. And I got to wonder, did they drop the ball? Is this a pro is this a failure in terms of security or intelligence or or is it a testament just to just how difficult it is to identify these people and stop them before they do something terrible? You know, in the case of London, we don't know enough yet to make the judgment to answer your question. I will tell you, so use the FBI here. They get leads every day, and they've got to sort immediate threats from not immediate threats. Yeah. And so what's happened to MI5 in the, in the London case could easily happen here. There's an overwhelming amount of information they get. They have legal standards about what they can pursue pursue and they've got limited resources and so the, these judgments are inevitable and looking back to us it says well why did you why did you let them go but it's this is really hard to pre to prevent and to predict in advance mm -hmm. you know and this is this happened and prior to this incident the, what we were talking about in terms of terror was about the restrictions uh, on flights that you couldn't bring your large electronic uh, devices in the cabin anymore that was the big story uh, and that there was a concern about um, terrorist organizations adjusting their tactics to get an explosives on a plane. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, that as, as they move, we move, and they move again, and so we're forced to change our change the way that we conduct business in order to protect ourselves? Sure, I mean, you know, so looking at the car, the car bomb, yeah. or the vehicle type attacks, 
it's Paris is putting up this this glass around the Eiffel Tower. I think you're going to see more and more of these iconic places where you're pushing the perimeter out and making it more difficult, trying to protect tourists so they feel like they can safely come to those places. On the airplane one, we've known that laptops were a threat, right? And they, we go through periods where we'll, we'll turn them on. I think you've got to assume that authorities don't believe that those old screening methods will be right. sufficient to the current threat. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It means that the bomb makers, the terrorist bomb makers, have reverse engineered our screening process to try and get around it. And so for the moment, current detection methods don't work. And so not only your laptops, but your iPads, um, they somehow figured out how to get the explosives in there beyond our detection capabilities. And until we can figure that out, they're going to ban them. Mm -hmm. From the perspective of a terror network, does it make sense to try continuously to launch a sophisticated attack using electronic equipment on an airplane like in 9-11 trying to do something spectacular? Or does it make sense to call out to all the people that support you to do attacks like this, which are much, much harder to predict and to protect people from? That's right. And I think what we're seeing is they're going to they're doing both. They're so doing both. while you're while you're working the more sophisticated, spectacular attack and you've got people working against that, it's easier to have these smaller scale things like the like the vehicle attacks. I will tell you, we ought to put it in perspective because I think your question is spot on. You know, we have to, every loss of life is tragic, but this is four or five deaths mm -hmm. as opposed to 9 11, which is 3,000. And so, what that suggests, Vlad, is we, Western security services, law enforcement and intelligence, we've spent $650 billion in the United States post 9 11 on security measures. It, what it suggests is, We've made tremendous progress against the big spectaculars. We've made it so hard, they've got to resort to these while they try to work around our security procedures. And to your point, we've got to move with them to prevent the big spectaculars. All right. Fran Townsend, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Sure.